at the heart of the Christian faith is a bloody cross. But that image of a blood sacrifice can be incredibly offensive in the modern world. Like, for instance, we've been going through the book of Exodus on on Sunday mornings as a church because we as a church usually take whole books of the Bible and we preach through verse by verse, passage by passage. And, And so I very much on purpose have been watching Prince of Egypt Uh, with my kids a lot, which is the Spielberg DreamWorks movie, which is probably like one of the best versions of the Exodus movie. But I found out this week that when Spielberg was, was writing it and crafting his vision, when it was time for the Passover lambs to be slain, he did not want blood on the doors because blood was too outdated. It was too icky and and thankfully, he talked to some, some Jewish rabbis who said, no, you have to have the blood. That is essential to our faith. You can't have the movie of the Exodus without the blood. And thankfully, they put it in the movie. But that sensibility of being offended by the blood is pretty widespread. Uh, for instance, some of you know Al Mohler. He is currently the president at Southern Seminary in Louisville. It's a, the Southern Baptist Seminary. And when he was a student there, before he became the president, on his very first day of class, the professor wanted everyone to introduce themselves. So the, so the professor said, hey, everybody stand up, say their name, say where you're from, and let me know your favorite hymn, like standard Bible college greeting. So, so fine, everyone goes up and they, they say their name, they say where they're from, they say their favorite hymn. And, and, and Al Mohler said he remembered that one girl got up, she said her name, she said where she was from, and then she told the class that her favorite hymn was, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. And that professor in that moment sternly told the young lady, There will be no bloody cross religion in my class. There will be no bloody religion in my class. I don't believe in a God who can only forgive sin if there is a sacrifice for blood. And it was in that moment that Al Mohler knew something was terribly, terribly wrong with the school he was attending. Because when that professor said that, what he essentially was saying, that there would be no Christianity in that class. When he said there would be no bloody religion in this class, he said there would be no cross, no sacrifice, no no biblical religion at all in his class. Because if you read the story of the Bible, it's a bloody story. The heart of the biblical story is a story about sin and blood and sacrifice and forgiveness. And of course, the good news of that theological institution is that when Al Mohler would become the president of Southern Seminary, he fired any professor who didn't believe that the Bible was the true word of God. And he fired any professor who didn't believe in a bloody Christian religion. And he literally was almost killed for it. But praise the Lord, today Southern Seminary preaches a bloody cross religion. But still, the question remains for us. How should we, as modern Christians who believe the whole Bible is the word of God, how should we respond to that kind of thinking? Like, why does God really need a sacrifice? Isn't he powerful enough to just forgive us our sins? But actually, according to the Bible, he is powerful enough. But our sin is such a big deal that the only possible solution for sin to be forgiven is if one who is innocent died in your place. But thankfully, this morning in Exodus chapter 12, we're going to read about that very solution. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Exodus chapter 12. If you're using a pew Bible, Exodus 12 is on page 63. And as you're turning to that chapter, let me... Let me tell you that we've been going through the story of Exodus, and that means that for the last month, we've been going through the 10 plagues, just little by little. And last week, we finally arrived at the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And in the 10th plague, God threatened to kill every firstborn son in the land, Egyptian or Israelite, man or beast. But God also provided a way of escape, that that if anyone who feared the Lord, anyone who who sacrificed an unblemished lamb and then covered the doorpost of their house and the lintel of their house with the blood, anyone who went into that house covered by the blood of the lamb, God would pass over that house and they would be spared from the wrath of the 10th plague. But then right in the middle of the action, right as the tension is building, right when things are getting good, Moses is going to pause the story and teach us how to celebrate the Passover feast. And he's going to tell, this is going to be something that Jewish people would do every single year for thousands of years, which, which on the surface, I'll just say, Moses, that seems like bad writing. Like in my mind, if I was reading Moses' first draft of Exodus, I'd be like, hey, Moses, maybe save like the ritual feast stuff for Leviticus and just tell a good story right now. You don't need to get into this detail. 
But the thing about Moses is that he did not write Exodus merely to write a good story. It is a good story. No, but Moses' goal in writing the first five books of the Bible was, was this. So that the next generation would remember how God saved his people through the Exodus. And, and that's my prayer for us this morning as we study the Exodus. My prayer is that we as a people would be devoted to remembering how God saved his people. Because as Moses tells us the story of the Passover, he is also going to give us five reasons to remember this day. Five reasons to remember this day. First, because Passover was the day of Israel's birth as a nation. We'll see that in verses 14 through 20. Second, in verses 21 through 28, Passover was a day of God's mercy. Third, in verses 29 through 32, it was a day of God's justice. Fourth, in verses 33 through 36, it was a day when God conquered. And finally, in verses 33 through 42, it was a day when God was faithful to keep his promises. It was the day of Israel's birth, a day of mercy, justice, a day when God conquered, and a day when God was faithful. We have, we have a whole lot to get in. I was actually hoping to get like a whole nother chapter into this sermon. And then last night I was right. I'm like, this sermon's going to be an hour long. So you're welcome. I cut it for you. But we still have a lot to dive into. So let's pray and we'll, we'll dive in. Lord God Almighty, I feel so weak right now. I, I feel like an insufficient messenger. And, and, and all of us are, are tired and wearied from, from our week without power and the difficulties that we've faced in our own lives. So as so we come to you and we ask that, that in the same way that you revealed yourself to both Israel and Egypt through your signs and wonders, would you work a wonder in our hearts now that the truth of who you are may be revealed in us through your word. And Heavenly Father, as I preach, may the sermon that is heard be far more effective than the one that is delivered. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at me to verse 14 of chapter 12, Exodus 12, verse 14. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your house. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. This was a feast, but it was no casual feast. This was to be taken so seriously that if anyone did not follow the rules precisely, they would be cut off. Which raises the question, like, what, is, what does it mean to be cut off? Like some scholars argue that this means deportation, that you get kicked out of the camp of Israel or get deported from the country of Israel. Others argue that this might even mean the death penalty, that someone is cut off from life. Now, I don't agree with either of those interpretations because in the Bible, there are times when certain things do deserve banishment or the death penalty, but they always come with instructions on how the person is to be punished. So, so instead, I'd agree with other biblical scholars who'd say that, that since only God knows if there's truly any leaven in your house, God is the one who will cut the person off. God will curse them in some way, which, like, to be honest, is not that much more comforting than deportation or execution. Is the God of the universe cutting you off? You see, our God is not a casual God. Our God cares deeply, not just that he is worship, but how he is worship. And of course, I get it. You may still be thinking, like, why on earth does God care how much leaven is in a person's house? I mean, we're talking about bread here. Who, why would the punishment be so hard for just a little leaven? And that's a fair question. And the answer is that this Memorial Day, this feast, was meant to be a foundational way in which the Israelites understood their very national identity. This feast was meant to be formative and to shape and mold the Israelites' entire existence as a nation. And every detail of this celebration is flooded with deep spiritual symbolism. And even though that symbolism is totally lost on you, like you probably came in here like, I have no idea what leaven or no leaven means at all. That's fair. The Israelites, three, 4,000 years ago, they would have known. Like they, they would have got what this meant. So, so let, me, let me tell you. Today, if, if you want to bake bread the way, you, I, I looked this up on Google because I have no idea how to bake bread. So someone correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> But the way you, you do this is you go down to tops, you pick up some flour, maybe a little bit of sugar, maybe a little bit of salt, but you also pick up some yeast. And there's like a little section you can buy yeast in its own little package and you have it on, on the shelf. You can buy leaven. But back then they didn't have tops. 
So the way that you would get leaven is you wouldn't have a little package of leaven. But what you actually do is you get a little bit of dough that already had leaven in it. And you'd mix a bit of your dough from the last batch of bread and you mix it together with your new batch because it just takes a little bit of leaven to raise the whole bread, to raise the whole lump. And voila, you got, you got some bread. It's pretty great. And so when the Israelites were told on the night of the Passover to make bread without yeast, without leaven, they would have to leave behind the old bread that they'd been carefully holding on to, possibly for years. And, and to, to put it in perspective, the old lump filled with yeast represented their entire life and their existence that they were leaving behind in Egypt. The Israelites had lived in Egypt for over 400 years, and during that time, many of them had come to adopt the Egyptian gods, and their evil practices, and in starting fresh with unleavened bread, saying, throw out the old lump, take in the new, this was God's way of calling his people to leave behind their old lives and old sins and to start fresh. And every year at Passover, as the people remembered this event, and as everyone in Israel would sweep and clean and make sure they had no leaven remaining in their house, it would have been a call to the Israelites to rededicate their lives to the Lord. It's kind of like we have New Year's resolutions every year. Oh, yeah, I probably should better my... But this was the way the Israelites were challenged to throw out their old sinfulness and to start new. And this is even why in in 1 Corinthians, when we're told about the leaven, we're told Christ is our Passover. Paul tells us that, say, hey, Jesus died for your sins. You can sin as much as you want. That's not what Paul says. Paul says Christ has been sacrificed as our Passover land. Therefore, throw out the leaven. Throw out the old lump. Throw out your old life that marked needing forgiveness by Jesus. Like there's this idea that you can have Jesus as your savior, but not as, as your Lord. And, and, and like as much as I love and appreciate so many of our friends at Word of Life, like this is a common thing that they say, that you can just pray a quick prayer and believe one time and then you got your get it out of hell free ticket. But, but the Bible says that if you really experience the grace of Jesus, if you really receive the Passover lamb who is Jesus, you will live a life that is changed. You will live a life where you throw out the old lump, throw out your old practices and begin something new. Because if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. They have become something new. That new life is not needed to be saved. Remember, the Israelites didn't need to change a single thing about them before God saved them out of Israel. But in response to God's salvation, God called them to live a holy life and to throw out the old lump and to get rid of the leaven. And and now you see why this command about getting rid of the yeast is so much more than, than just about a command about bread. This is a command about sin and idolatry and true worship. And, and that's why every single time they would have this Passover festival, they were called to reevaluate their lives and to repent of their sins and to start fresh. But that's not all the ceremony would include. Look to verse 16. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly. And on the seventh day, a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that, uh, what, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. If you wondered why it's a seven-day feast, that's a good question because it's one day. Passover was one event. And now as they're celebrating in the future, they're spending seven days to celebrate. Why seven days? You know, Sometimes people will ask me as, as the only pastor in town, they'll say, are, are you one of those crazy Bible thumpers who believes that God made the whole world in seven days? And I'll tell them, oh no, of course not. I don't believe that. Because uh, I believe God created the world in six days and he rested on seven. <laughs> and, and so if you're wondering why the Israelites were commanded to rest for seven days to remember the single day of Passover, it's because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh. And so now to remember when God created the nation of Israel, the people were to do nothing but rest for seven whole days as they remembered this act of God's new creation, a new nation. Verse 17, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for on this day, I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Side note, we talked about this a little last week, but don't forget that when God freed the Israelites from slavery, he literally recreated their calendar. Like imagine if when the founding fathers got together and they signed the Declaration of Independence, they're like, July is the first month of the year. 
And so when God freed the people from slavery in Egypt and he said, this is Passover and we send my plagues, he's like, this month is now month number one. And he recreated their whole calendar. And, and, and so just think about like, like we have a bunch of different holidays scattered about. Like we have religious holidays and we have national holidays. But combine all of those together because this Passover, this Memorial Day would be like if you combine New Year's with Fourth of July with Easter and Christmas. Like that's, that's, that is the culmination of how important this festival would have been in the life of the people. And then verse 19, look at this. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, the person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner, foreigner, or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. Stop there. You may have noticed that this sounds familiar, like we've already read it a couple times, and that is on purpose. There is a lot of repetition going on here because God is repeating these rules over and over again intentionally to drill this into the minds of the Israelites. This is important. Make sure you get it right. And this Passover was the first day of Israel's life as a nation. But this Passover was also a glorious display of God's mercy. Look to verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourself according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Can you imagine how terrifying that night would have been? Don't even step outside for a moment because if you do, the Lord might allow the destroyer to get you and you may be struck dead. Who is the destroyer? That's a great question. I have no idea. And neither do most biblical stars. This has been debated for thousands of years. And if you want to get real nerdy and you want to get into conversation about the history of biblical interpretation and who the destroyer is, come talk to me later. But we'll say that. The point of this passage is that, that God isn't going to save his people from death, but through death. God is not going to save his people from judgment, but through judgment. And the only escape through this dark and terrible night is by the blood of a spotless sacrifice. And this is the heart of the Christian faith. This is the heart of the gospel message. If gospel is a word that means good news, of the good news of the Bible is that the only escape from God's righteous wrath is if Jesus were to come and die as your substitute. The only hope anyone in here has to be saved from God's wrath, for God's wrath to pass over you, is if God's wrath did not pass over Jesus on the cross. And this is why, once again, Paul tells us that Christ is our Passover lamb who has been sacrificed because Jesus lived an innocent, spotless, sinless life so that his perfect blood could be shed on the cross. Not just to provide refuge for one house. That's all these lambs. One lamb equals one house of protection. Not even to provide protection for one nation. Like we look at the Day of Atonement in the book of Leviticus, that, that this one sacrifice covers all of the people of Israel. But when Jesus comes, he dies as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he provides a house of refuge for anyone and everyone who would believe in him and who would enter by the door. And so here we are in Exodus. The destroyer is at the door. God is ready to strike down all the firstborn in all the land. The tension is building. We're ready for a good story. And then once again, Moses shuts it down. Like he's, he's done telling the story of the destroyer. And he interrupts the story to tell future generations how they were to remember this night. Look to verse 24. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. And then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, they did. Stop there. Children are filled with some of the most wonderful questions that you would never even think or imagine to ask. 
sometimes too many questions, sometimes an overwhelming amount of questions. Like when you have your first child, you're like, oh, this, this kid's going to be smart. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to talk. I'm going to answer every question. So they're going to be ready in school and more and more kids come. And you're like, just don't ask me. You're going to have to learn how to Google this. It's, it's overwhelming. But the beauty of the minds of young children is that they are tenaciously curious. And, and so as the Israelites were that they were, they were to be ready to answer their children's question because the Passover feast was designed to be a living sermon. The Passover feast was designed to be this deeply symbolic divine play that would be played over and over and over again every year in the lives of the Israelites. That every new year, as you pick out a spotless lamb and you kill it, it would be like watching a play. It's a living sermon that, that, that is preaching this message. You deserve death for your sin. A sermon that is preaching that you desperately need a spotless substitute to take your place. A sermon that is, that is preaching this lamb is not enough. Next year you're going to need another one. And all of this is meant to prepare the people for a final ultimate sacrifice who would take away sin once and for all. And so, so when children saw this sermon unfold, their parents were to tell them that on the night when God showed mercy and spared his people through the blood of the land. They were to point to God's mercy. But the people were also to remember this day as a day of divine justice. Look to verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where someone was not dead. And then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. Stop there. Finally, after 10 plagues and a lot of conversation, Pharaoh finally obeys the voice of Yahweh. Finally, he submits to the power of, of Yahweh. He, he, even, he is a God in Egypt, a God above gods, and he says, go and serve the Lord. And, and that word serve is so deep and profound because in Hebrew, this word serve can have a double meaning. Like to serve someone can mean not only to be their slave, but also to worship them. So, so even though Pharaoh, as the, as the chief god, the, the head honcho, the, the king over all, he's the one that should have deserved the worship. He says, you go and worship Yahweh. He is finally done and has been humbled. Now, of course, in verse 32, there is evidence of his insincerity. We know that if you know the story, Pharaoh is going to chase after them all the way to the Red Sea, and he's going to try to enslave them again. But there's evidence that he's not sincere in his apology because, because look at verse 32. If Pharaoh was truly sorry, he would not have asked for blessing. He would have asked for forgiveness. So many want the Lord's blessing, but not the Lord's forgiveness. And truly, there is no way to separate the two. Pharaoh and his forefathers had systematically enslaved, oppressed, abused, and murdered the Israelites, God's own people. The people God himself called his firstborn son. And Pharaoh said, okay, you can go this time. You can go this time. You can go. And he lied again and again and again. And yet he did not ask for forgiveness. He asked for blessing. And so after 430 years of God's patience, this was a night where God definitively and publicly judged Egypt for all of their wicked crimes against God and man. And this is a reminder to all of us that there is a day coming when all of us will have to answer for everything that we've ever done. That though God is incredibly patient towards those who are unrighteous, though there is a season in which God allows people to, to live in their wickedness, he is doing that so that they may come to repentance. That God is patience and kind and tolerance toward the ungodly that they may repent. But there is a day his patience will run out and he will judge the souls of everyone living and dead. So this was a day of justice, a foreshadowing of that great day of justice to come. But it was also a day when God conquered as a reigning king. Look to verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. Smart thinking. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. Verse 35, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. 
And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. By the time the plagues are over, the Egyptians are so ready. They're like, take all of my silver and gold and just be gone from here. But this goes back to chapter one, where Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites because they were too numerous. And Pharaoh was worried about this. Pharaoh was worried that this this Hebrew immigrant slave population was going to become so strong that they were going to rise up and, and go to war with Egypt. And so it was out of that fear and that superstition, that, that prejudice that, that, we, that he enslaved the Israelites. But it did turn out that the Israelites would go to war with the Egyptians. And in verse 36, as the Israelites take the gold and silver of the Egyptians, we read they plundered the Egyptians, which is language of warfare. This is the language of a nation winning a war and taking its spoils of war. And it turns out that Pharaoh brought about exactly what he feared by doing evil against the Israelites. Except, of course, it was not the Israelites who went to war against the Egyptians, it was Yahweh. It was Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. And let me tell you something. Our God is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. And when Yahweh goes to war, he wins every single time. Our God conquered Egypt without a single Israelite fighting by his side, without any God or king to challenge him, without breaking a sweat. The Lord conquered Pharaoh and all the gods of Egypt easily. And it's on this day as God creates the nation of Israel and as God displays both his mercy and his justice and as God conquers Egypt and he sends his people to plunder the Egyptians, this was a day when God was also faithful to keep all his promises to Abraham. Look to verse 37. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on on foot, besides women and children. I'll just say that back in Genesis 22... God famously promised Abraham, hey, look up at the stars, and if you can count them, that's going to be your descendants. Or or look at the sand of the seas, and if you can count them, that's going to be your descendants. By the time Abraham dies, he has two kids. But by the time we get to verse 37, see how incredibly the Israelites have been fruitful and multiplied. And then in verse 38, they're not alone. It's not just the son's and daughters of Abraham, looked at verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Going back to Genesis chapter 12, God promised not only to bless Abraham and his descendants, but God also promised that through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And in verse 38, you have a mixed multitude, meaning both Israelite and non-Israelite, Egyptian or any and every nationality who wanted to leave with them, anyone who was convinced by God's power and display through the 10 plagues, anyone who sought shelter in the house of an Israelite exited Egypt with the Israelites. That's why when Jesus came, he, not, he came not only as the Passover lamb for the house of Israel, but for the world. And that's why even today, even though I'm assuming most of us are not physically descended from Abraham, That's why, even though most of us do not physically descend from this lineage, whoever believes in Jesus, no matter your race or nationality, no matter your your country or your background or your language, anyone who believes in Jesus can worship the God of Abraham and become a part of God's holy people and even receive the blessing that God promised to Abraham. And in verse 38, these are just some of the first fruits of God's fulfillment of this promise to bless all the nations through Abraham. And then we read in verse 39, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out for Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor they prepared any provisions for themselves. Verse 40, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Also go back to Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God said to Abraham, know for certain Your offspring will be foreigners in a foreign land and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. And in verses 40 through 41, we see that God kept that promise. 30 years they lived in Egypt as free men. 400 years they lived as slaves, exactly as God had promised. 
And in verses 40 through 41, God judged Egypt, freed his people, gave the Israelites great possessions exactly as he promised to Abraham so long ago. And so this day would be a reminder to all future generations that the Lord was faithful to keep his promises. And then we read this, verse 42. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the peoples of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord watched over his people that night and he was faithful to protect them and to spare them and to preserve them and to save them. And so in response to the Lord's faithfulness, God's people are called to keep the Passover as a night of watching. What's that mean? And it's not a phrase we, we use normally. It means that Passover was meant to remind the people of all the ways was, the Lord was faithful in the past. And, and so now as they watch and wait for the rest of his promises to be kept, they could watch with the eyes of faith, knowing that he would do all that he promised to do. Amen? Amen. Do you watch and wait for the Lord's promises with that kind of anticipation? I hope you do. See, my prayer this morning is that we would be a people devoted to remembering how God has saved his people. Because in Exodus 12, we were given five reasons to remember the Passover. Because it was the day of Israel's birth, a day of God's mercy, a day of God's justice, a day when God conquered, and a day when God was faithful. Let me say, we as Christians, we are so forgetful. Like like how many of you are, are struggling right now to trust that God is going to provide for you because you've forgotten that he has always provided for you up until this point. Like like how many of you are falling into those same old temptations and sins and patterns because you've forgotten that in Christ you are a new creation? How many of you are so filled with guilt and shame because you've already forgotten that you've been made clean by the blood of Christ? Church, so many of our worries and our problems are directly related to the fact that we constantly fail to remember. We fail to remember what Jesus has promised. We fail to remember who we are in Christ. And most importantly, we fail to remember what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. But the good news is that this morning I have three pastoral charges. I have three ways that this good news can be remembered and so that we would not be so easily, not, we would not so easily forget these truths. First pastoral charge, big one. Teach the gospel to the next generation. Teach the gospel to the next generation. You know, both in the Old and New Testament, it was expected and assumed that children of all ages were to be present during worship. In fact, for the first 1,800 years of church history, it was normal for children of all ages to be a part of church's worship service. It was actually only until recently the Western church decided to start kicking kids out of the service. But the Sunday worship service was actually designed for Christians of all ages. And and like, I don't know about you, like members of Horkin Baptist Church, that brings me comfort that we don't have to be a mega church to provide a big kids ministry to to be faithful to God's command to disciple the next generation. Like what we need is the Sunday morning gathering. What we need is the church. And, And I'll say this, you should be teaching your kids at home and you should read the Bible with your kids at home and you should sing hymns with your kids at home and you should model what it looks like to be a Christian at home. But please also bring your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids to church because when they're able to see you sing and pray and read scripture with the people of God, they're learning what it looks like to worship Jesus as his bride, as his church. Like there are so many people who think I can live my own Christian life independent of the church. I can go into the woods and I can have my church. And like you can worship God everywhere. That's right. But in heaven, there will be no lone Christians. In in heaven, there will be no Christians off in the woods having their own private worship service. In heaven, we are all gathered together around the throne. And what the worship service does on Sunday morning is it gives us a preview of that heavenly worship service that goes on and on forever and ever in which every hour is better than the one before. that's, That's what this worship service is meant to do. And so when you bring your children into this service, you're teaching them what that looks like. And I know, of course, like some people would say, but they're too young to understand what's going on. And I say, amen. Like, of course they are. And you know whose job it is to explain to them what is going on. It's y'all's job. It's my job as a parent. And as a side note, I know we we talk about deep stuff as a church on Sunday mornings. Uh, but I was able to actually put my sermons into Microsoft Word, and I, and I ran this program that's, that selected the, the, the reading level. And it turns out I preach roughly at a 7th or 8th grade reading level. 
and, and that was very hard for me. When I first came to this church, I was, I was much not, not great. And I think it, it's a lot harder to make things more basic than more complicated. But, but the reason my goal is to keep it as a low reading level so that kids can be welcome and understand at least some of the things I'm talking about. And, and plus, let me just say this. I, I say most kids are a lot smarter than you give them credit for. And they pick up way more than you realize. That's where you say the word you don't want them to say and suddenly they're saying it all. I mean, they pick things up. I'm telling you. But when you bring your kids into the church, don't just bring them in, but explain to them what you're doing. Teach them the songs we sing and what they mean. Show your kids how to confess their sins and how Jesus can forgive their sins. But like even in our church, you, you have to be a baptized believer to take communion. But at, if you're a believer and you're taking communion, show, this is the blood of Christ. You can't have this, but if you believe in Jesus, yes. This is the body of Christ broken for sinners. You can't have this, but if you believe, yes. This is how we teach and instruct and show our kids what our faith is all about. And let me say, as a church, I am well aware of where we are at. I have been praying since before I got here to see young children in this church. And I believe the Lord is going to answer that prayer powerfully. So let me tell you now, church, get ready. I want every one of you to be ready to welcome children to this church with open arms. And that means that if you hear a baby crying during a sermon, do not get annoyed. Once again, praise the Lord that child is here and thank the Lord that the gospel is being passed down to the next generation. If a kid spills carpet, or spills uh, juice on the carpet, praise the Lord. I don't want a clean carpet. I want kids in the church. If there's something sticky, if there's something loud, praise the Lord. I'm praying for crayon markers on the walls and coffee stains on the carpet. And if it meet, all for the sake of seeing God glorified and disciples being multiplied through the power of the gospel and passed on to the next generation. Amen. Amen. That's just pastoral charge one. Number two. <laughs> Second pastoral charge. Remember the gospel through communion. Remember the gospel through communion. On this side of the cross, we actually don't celebrate Passover at all. So like if you're worried that we've got a lamb outside and we're about to cut it and say, hey kids, come look at, we're not doing that. Because now that Jesus has come as the true and better Passover lamb, we don't need to sacrifice anymore. But when Jesus came to offer his life, he gave us a new feast. No longer to celebrate what happened in the Exodus, but now to celebrate what happened on the cross. And that feast is communion. And in communion, we get a living sermon. We get a sermon that is preached where the the broken body of Christ is the bread and and the wine is the blood spilled out for the forgiveness of sins. And you know, we don't believe that communion has the power to forgive sins. And so when we take communion, we're not doing it because we need forgiveness, but because we need to be reminded that of the forgiveness we've already received in Jesus. And I think a part of the reason the early church took communion every single Sunday is because they knew they needed to be reminded of the sacrifice of Christ every single Sunday. Like I, I came from a Roman Catholic background where communion was a very big thing. It did forgive your sins. And then I, I went to a Baptist background where we did once every three or four months we would do communion. And it was almost like, oh, yeah, I forgot we do this as a church. Um, but then I remember I got placed at a church with an internship against my will and they did communion every single Sunday. And I was very afraid and worried. I'm like, do you believe this is forgiving your sins? And they said, no, it just reminds us of the gospel every Sunday. And, and I remember when I went to that church, communion became like one of my favorite parts of the service because the preacher would get up. We, we would sing the gospel. We'd sing about Jesus. They'd preach about Jesus. We'd read about Jesus. And then we would get a living sermon every single Sunday and get to engage our senses, our taste, our sight, our smell. It is a beautiful and wonderful thing. And that's even next week. We'll talk a lot more about communion because next week is Passover part three. And I'm, I'm actually very excited about next week. But, but remember Christ through communion. That's even why we have communion today. Final pastoral charge. Believe the gospel for yourself. Believe the gospel for yourself. The word gospel is simply a word that means good news. And the good news of the Bible is that Jesus lived the perfect life we failed to live. He died the death mankind deserved. And then three days later, he rose from the grave and defeated death like nobody else ever could. And so let me ask you, if God this very night passed through Brant Lake, what would happen? Would God pass over you or would he give you the justice you deserve? Are you in danger or are you covered by the blood of the lamb? If you have no substitute, then you should expect nothing but God's righteous and eternal wrath in hell. If you haven't put your faith in the blood of Christ, you have no hope. But if you will remember what Jesus has done for sinners, if you will repent of your sins, if you will put your faith alone in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, then by the blood of Jesus, your sins will be forgiven. You will receive God's mercy and you will be saved. Amen.
Let me end with this illustration from New Testament scholar D.A. Carson. Listen to how D.A. Carson pictures the, and imagines the night of Passover. He says this, Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. The day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen, and Smith says to Brown, Bori, are you getting a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? Brown says, well, God told us what to do through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the lamb and daubed the doorposts with blood and put blood on the lintel? Haven't you done that? Are you all ready and packed to go? You're going to eat the whole Passover meal with your family? And the other one says, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. But it's still pretty scary thinking about all the things that have happened recently. You know, flies and river turning to blood. Pretty awful. And now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed, you know? It's all right for you. You have three sons. I only have one. I love my Charlie. And the angel of death is passing through tonight, you know? I know what God says, and I put the blood there, but it's pretty scary, and I'll be glad when this night is over. And the other one responds, bring it on. I trust in the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land, which lost his son. And the answer, of course, is neither. Neither lost their son. Because death did not pass over them on the grounds of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercise, but on the grounds of the blood of the lamb. It is not based upon your good works or how much you believe or how strongly you believe, but it is only if you are under and protected by the blood of the Lamb. It is not the intensity of our faith that saves, but the object of our faith that saves. And that's why we sing, For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim, I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. For Jesus paid it all, to all him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, yet he washed it white as snow. That's where our hope is today as Christians. Is that where your hope is? And on that note, all the people said, Amen. Amen.